if you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. So I'm Brett Nelson from New York City. It's my first time in Kentucky. Um, and they don't really appreciate seersucker up in Manhattan very well. Hey, Mike here. We here at Ultrasound Podcast, we're minding our own business, performing excessive and ridiculously awesome ultrasounds, when we recently received a link to some of the lectures from CastleFest 2016. So we opened said lectures and said to ourselves, selves, this stuff is spectacular. Literally, some of the best lectures I've ever seen. Seriously, the content and the presenters at CastleFest has gotten better year by year. And we would be heathens to keep it from you. So we've decided to release some of these wonderful lectures over the next month or so and share some of the awesomeness that was CastleFest 2016. We'll start off our tour to Castle with a newbie to CastleFest, but someone who we've long admired, and that's Brett Nelson. Brett is a wonderful educator from Mount Sinai in New York City and is easily one of the most dynamic and exciting lecturers I've ever met. Brett's going to talk to us about something we've honestly probably not given enough credence to on the podcast, and that's pediatric ultrasound. I'm going to talk a little bit about pediatric ultrasound. And, um, you know, one thing that is uh, really important to know about uh, kids is that they are not just little adults. Um, jockeys are little adults, right? Yes. He's right. Jockeys are little adults, which reminds me, if you want to come hang with some jockeys at Castlefest and see some of the greatest horse racing in the world, have some of the finest bourbon in the world, and just have an incredible time, go to castlefest2017.com and register now. The registration's open, and we actually had several people register this year before we even announced it. They found the link and registered. So don't miss out on getting your spot. Now, Brett, continue. So, uh... And, and that's, you know, the reason why it's important to distinguish between the adults and the children is because uh, most of what I do when I'm doing ultrasound in pediatrics is actually the same kind of stuff that I would do in adults, right? Um, we see up to age 21 in my environment, so we're doing a ton of pelvic ultrasounds, we're doing a ton of abscesses, we're doing gallbladders, and you know, all, all kinds of stuff that we would do in, in adults. So I'm trying to focus a little bit on this talk on the stuff that you would do specifically for pediatrics. Now, for pediatrics, it's head to toe. Right? Again, a lot of it overlaps with what you would do in an adult. Maybe the techniques are different. Maybe the literature is a bit different. Um, and maybe some, there's some nuances. But just remember that anything that you would see in an adult, you could potentially see in a child. Right? So uh, if you have that kid with a uh, you know, distal radius fracture and you want to avoid uh, procedural sedation, you can detect the fracture, do your nerve blocks, um, distract them, and without even the use of sedation, have an entirely painless procedure reduce it, not have to use fluoroscopy or send them back and forth between the emergency department and radiology to confirm that you've uh, fixed the fracture. So is that a pediatric application of ultrasound or is that really just a musculoskeletal application of ultrasound? Uh, venous access, you know, the, uh, you know, Mike and Matt have done a great deal of work uh, and, uh, you know, they didn't invent venous access for, for kids, but they've certainly brought it to the next level with the I am not a pincushion um, uh, concept and, uh, and teaching uh, physicians, physician assistants, nurses, etc., all around the country to use ultrasound to guide IV access because it's uh, it's a painful process to go through multiple sticks. And something again that we tolerate in adults, it's it's a standard thing that you have a patient who's a frequent flyer, they'll roll up their sleeve and get stuck 15 times, and nobody really bats an eye about it, right? Two sticks in a kid is painful. One stick in a kid is painful. No kid wakes up in the morning thinking that they're going to have a needle stuck in their arm, right? So, you know, just using, again, similar concepts that you would in adults. Um, there's a lot of literature coming out on uh, pneumonia. Pneum the detection of pneumonia in pediatrics is more sensitive in ult with ultrasound than it is with uh, chest x-ray. Jim Sung, one of my colleagues from Mount Sinai, just had an article published in Chest this month about that. But that falls on the heels of other literature that suggests that you can have a kid and, and really detect pneumonia really well. Huge uh, amplifications in, uh, in developing nations uh, where x-ray is not readily available. And there's a lot of things that you can scan in the chest is one of them. They're actually a lot easier in a child than in an adult. 
right? Um, if you're looking for a pneumonia in a really squirmy, crying kid that can't sit still long enough, and you've seen those chest x-rays where it's a blurry torso and then like four hands holding them, right? Um, versus let the kid squirm and cry all they want, or maybe they won't squirm and cry because they're laying in mom or dad's arms, and then you can just slide the probe all up and down their skin. They're only this big, and they don't have that much hair on them, you know? Try to translate the exact same technique to like a large, hairy adult. It's really hard to detect pneumonia in an adult. So, you know, abscesses and foreign bodies, um, looking at, uh, at trauma assessments, people around the country, especially in pediatric centers, really try to avoid those unnecessary pan man scans that we love to do in adults um, and, and using serial abdominal examinations with fast exam, you know, highly applicable to pediatrics. In, in septic kids, um, looking for uh, hip effusion as well um, in, in a patient that you're concerned about uh, transient synovitis versus septic hip, uh, just looking one side to the other. So, so many things that you could uh, evaluate. I'll talk a little bit more tomorrow when I talk about renal ultrasound. You're looking at the bladder, right? Uh, assessment for sepsis or for fever in an infant. You're going to do a bladder catheterization to get urine and you'll have a 75% chance that you'll get urine, meaning a 25%, one out of four times, you're gonna have a dry tap, which is painful for the kid, it's painful for the parents, and even if you're a cruel, cold-hearted person, you don't care, it just wastes your time, right? So you can go from a 25% failure rate to a 4% failure rate just by looking at the bladder before you catheterize it. I think this is such a crucial point here. I hear people say often that they don't have time to do the ultrasound. But in the vast majority of cases, you're actually going to be saving time by doing the scan. Brett talks about it in the setting of looking at the bladder to see if the patient isn't peeing because of some kind of outflow obstruction or if they aren't making urine. But this is applicable to all ultrasound that we do. To me, one of the main advantages of bedside clinician performed ultrasound is that you are performing and interpreting the scan as soon as you need it. Not when you finally get a hold of the on-call tech, wait for the patient to be wheeled to the radiology department, and then wait for the ultrasound to be read by the radiologist, which can literally take hours. If you do it at bedside, literal seconds. Ultrasound is beneficial irrespective of you being an asshole or not. So is that diagnostic? Is it procedural? Is it really peds, right? The point is it's another application. So, uh, and then you've got testicular torsion, et cetera. So there's a ton of different things you can do with ultrasound. So I wanted to focus today, especially to keep us on time so that we're, we're out scanning again at 2.30 on looking at some of the things that are relatively more pediatric specific. So we're gonna talk a little bit about intussusception and appendicitis. You can use couple different kinds of probes. Just like um, Chris Fox mentioned before, you can use a curvilinear probe or you could use the linear probe. Depends on the body habitus of your patient. And for appendicitis, we're basically looking at uh, a couple of different landmarks to bring us to the general vicinity. And I'll tell you, I didn't used to do this very often. As much as I love ultrasound and as much as I appreciate uh, Matt's introduction before about how I've been involved and really enthusiastic about ultrasound for a long time, I've only worked in really busy inner city emergency departments where there's always somebody, there's, no, there's always somebody following me around, not to help me or get me stuff or hand me things, but just to nag me about my patients per hour and my RVUs and my press gainy scores and stuff. So things can get a little tense, right? So I've, I don't really very often on shift much to some people's surprise, just scan to scan. So if scanning is going to move the patient forward, if it's going to make them safer or better or pre you know, prevent a, a complication or something like that, I'm all over it. Um, but uh, if there's a doorway diagnosis, I don't wheel the ultrasound machine in to confirm it. So I didn't used to think appendicitis was a good use of my time. I've come around to it. But I still haven't gotten onto the bandwagon of spending 45 minutes finding a normal appendix. I tend to go where the pain is, and, and what I found in my experience, and some of the literature sort of matches this up, if, if, uh, if you go where the pain is and it's positive, you're pretty likely to find it relatively quickly. Um, and if you, once you start going on that um, uh, very robust fishing expedition to look for the appendix, whether it's positive or negative, you, you can turn that into a time sink. So anyway, that's my general thought process on it, and uh, you're basically looking for where the cecum meets up with the ilium, and just medial to that, you'll see, is where the appendix is going to attach, just to kind of keep the anatomy in mind. So um, sensitivity, depending on which literature you look at, is somewhere between 83 and 88%. Specificity is reasonably uh, high. So 
what winds up happening if you're doing this on your own, you're either going to develop a bit of relationship with your surgeons or your ped surgeons, and they'll get to know you and trust you, okay? And that might sound overly specific, but I bet there's not more than one or two ped surgeons at your hospital. And if, like most places in the country, um, you're, you're probably going to have one ped surgeon covering multiple hospitals. So already you have an intimate relationship with that person to begin with because there's not 16 different ped surgeons in your, in your place. And... If you think that it's weird that maybe you and three or four of your colleagues who do more ultrasound than maybe the other folks, you, you, they get to know you and trust you, they're the same way with the radiologists. You know, it, it happens all the time that a surgeon will say like, well, the radiologist read this way and they're like, well, let me look at the images or if it was this one versus that one, you know, I kind of trust them, this one overcalls it. So I don't get offended by that kind of stuff when people are wondering, you know, how many have I done or that we haven't had a, like a face-to-face -face or we haven't had a phone call conversation because that's just how surgery and imaging work together anyway. So um, again, I just go where the pain is, right? So if it's McBurney's point, if it's right lower quadrant, it's going to be the area that made me suspicious for appendicitis to begin with. I tend to look with the probe in a transverse orientation, marker towards the patient's right, and st start fanning around. Some of the anatomy that I'm looking for is um, in the deep pelvis, right? Behind all the bowel. So if, you know, sometimes you just put the probe down and you see the appendix, right? But we're not going to talk about that yet. Deep to everything, there's going to be psoas muscle. And psoas muscle is going to have a very characteristic, marbled, round, muscle-looking appearance on ultrasound. And just medial to it, you'll see the iliac vessels, the iliac artery and vein. So I want to make sure that I can visualize that stuff because that is going to be my, uh, my safety net. Right? I'm looking for the appendix, and then if I find the appendix, I'm, I might want to confirm it based on the presence of those structures behind it. And if I don't see the appendix, I want to confirm the presence of those structures, the psoas and the iliac vessels, to make sure that I was even looking in the right spot. So this is the kind of thing that you see when you start looking at bowel ultrasound, right? if you're lucky. Because you guys seen a lot of bowel when you were in the session this morning, right? And a lot of times you just see air every place, okay? And depending on when the patient last ate and if they've got any gastroenteritis, which some of your appendicitis rule out patients are going to wind up having, you just see this snowstorm of, of air, right? So let's simplify this picture a little bit so that we can focus our view rather than on the whole darn screen and not knowing what you're looking for to focus it on the relevant stuff. So first of all, everything above this green line here is skin, sub tissue, and then abdominal musculature. And then what you'll wind up seeing in that big green line there is equivalent to like a lung sliding that you'd see in the chest. You're seeing peritoneum sliding on the abdominal musculature, okay? So everything above that bright white line is off the table. You don't have to worry about that. The appendix is not going to be there. If you scan a little bit lower, you're going to see this circular structure that's mostly hypoechoic, medium gray, that's got some bright white speckle through it, which is a classic appearance of muscle. So it's no different than what Chris Fox was referring to with, uh, you know, quadzilla, I guess you guys call him Matt Dawson, um, and, and, you know, looking through the muscles of the thigh or the arm or any place else, right? So psoas muscle. And then you'll see vessels. I'll hide them again here, right? Artery and vein. So now you're left really with this little triangle in between here, okay? Typically a bit medial and anterior to the psoas muscle, uh, anterior to the iliac vessels, and that's now the area that you're looking for. And this is the first step, right? So find the area where the appendix might be hiding. And then the next step's the really tricky part, and this is the part that does require a lot of practice, and this is the part that you, you, it's Goldilocks. You can't be too hard, you can't be too soft, and that's what graded compression means. Has anybody heard the term graded compression? So graded compression is using just the right amount of pressure to be able to visualize the appendix, okay? Because when you first look in the right lower quadrant, you're probably just going to see a lot of bowel gas, and there's going to be too much intestine in the way. So you have to put enough pressure to sort of get that stuff out of the way. But if you put too much pressure, you'll squish the appendix and you won't be able to see it. Because it's going to be a pretty tiny structure to begin with, probably less than half a centimeter. By definition, because if it's greater than that, you're getting into appendicitis territory. So too little pressure, you won't be able to see anything. Too much pressure, you won't be able to see anything. So you sort of lower and raise the pressure gradually in the right lower quadrant 
in this vicinity when you can't find the structures that you're looking for. Or again, I tend to focus my view on where it hurts. An older patient can tell you, and by older, I just mean old enough to listen to these instructions, put the probe where it hurts, right? So there are four-year-olds that can help you with that, and there are 60-year-olds who can't. So just, you know, get the probe to where the pain is and start looking around in that area, grading the compression up and down, back and forth a little bit. So you want to look at it in a longitudinal view like we saw in the previous view. And like anything else that we see that's three-dimensional, we want to look at it in a transverse view as well and then just measure across from the outer wall to the outer wall. And, you know, this is a pretty nice view where you can actually see layers of mucosa um, and actual what, what's referred to sometimes by radiologists as gut signature, right? So the different layers of the bowel wall. And again, you see psoas, peritoneum, and vessels so you know you're in the right vicinity. So here's an example where you can see thinner bowel over here, and on the edge over here, it looks a little bit thicker. So this is actually the area in between the cecum here, which is larger, and then this thinner gut signature here, okay? Now, a couple reasons why that's not appendicitis, right? That's too big. So that is scary because I'm looking for a large structure greater than six millimeters, right? But it's, it's moving, it's peristalsing, and you can't really see the pressure in this particular video clip, but pressure compressed it, okay? So this just helps me is another way to know that I'm in the right spot because I can sort of follow around in that right lower quadrant and if I see large bowel, so a larger diameter, thicker wall, and then I see it sort of leading into this neck here where the ileocecum is attaching right here, and then I can look around in this vicinity. Now, I don't see the appendix in this view, but that spot lets me know that I'm in the right location. So there's a couple of things in, in bowel sonography where, you know, basically people describe sort of a lawnmower approach where you fan, you know, all the way up and then go down and just a stepwise fashion to make sure you don't miss anything, okay? Some people do a similar thing when they're looking for pneumo uh, pneumonia in the chest. So, again, I probably don't spend a lot of time doing this. Other people spend a little more than me and some a lot less, but I, I want to get to that main spot first and then just fan up and down a little bit to make sure I'm insinating that, that region at least. So what, is the appendis what does appendicitis need to have? So by definition, it has to be non-compressible. Okay, so that's easy. You see what you think is the appendix. You just put pressure, and uh, as you see the tissues around it deform, if it's not moving, it's non-compressible. It should be a blind ending tubular structure. So it shouldn't continue endlessly in either direction because sometimes a little collapsed loop of bowel and you'll see them on ultrasound because you've seen them on x-ray reports. I mean, uh, on CAT scan reports, right? Collapsed loop of bowel, you know, inc incomplete enteric contrast, can't exclude, blah, 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 right? And then you get mad at the radiologist. Well, now it's your turn, smart guy. Now you've got a probe in your hand and you're looking at non-compressed bowel. What do you think? Ah, it's not so easy, is it? So now you need to make sure that you follow that structure because the appendix should end. So if you follow it out longitudinally, you should be able to see it has a little round end to it, and the other end should attach to the, to the cecum. It needs to be greater than six millimeters in diameter, and it should lack peristalsis. So it really should have all those characteristics. So, and sometimes it's just too dark, so screw that image. All right, so here, longitudinal view, okay? There's the gut signature. You see dark and bright around the edge here. You lose it a little bit to some bowel gas here. There's dark and bright over here. Um, this structure ends. You see how it rounds off there? Okay. And you want to make sure you're scanning through back and forth. Okay. When you have a cylinder, I'll talk a little math here for a minute. If you have an infinitely long cylinder, you can take a cross section of it and it's a circle, right? And if you look at it in a longitudinal view, and it's infinitely long, it's going to look like two parallel lines going off forever, train tracks in the distance. But if you get it oblique, it'll look like it ends. So just make sure that you're scanning transverse and longitudinal, again, looking at a three-dimensional structure two-dimensionally, and follow it to the end. And here we see, if each of these is five millimeters, this is greater than six millimeters, uh, there's no peristalsis going on within it, and it is, uh, and then this image doesn't show its compressibility, but you should be able to tell that, okay? So this was kind of an interesting case. I had um, a young woman, she's kind of heavy, she had right-sided abdominal pain, up and lower, okay? 
and she was just kind of most comfortable when she was hunched over in the bed. So we looked like pretty, it was pretty well higher than McBurney's point. That's where she was tender. She was tender just like lateral to the umbilicus, okay? So to the right of her umbilicus. Um, and I wound up seeing this structure. So what, what is this structure? I'm sorry? Uh, appendicolith, yeah. What else could it be though? So if you're saying that's an appendicolith, then what's the circle that it's inside of? The appendix. Okay, well, what else could this be? The gallbladder. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the thing is, and so I was kind of debating back and forth because it was like it was not down here and it was not up here. It was here, <laughs> right? So she basically had this retrocecal appendix, which looked an awful, now that's not liver and it wasn't fooling me that it could be liver, but could you imagine like liver, gallbladder, big stones, fluid, right? Cholecystitis, different operation than appendix, you know? Um, d embarrassing to talk to the surgeons, you know? Uh, so, so anyway, we were looking and we just followed it down and eventually, yeah, it seemed like it led a little bit lower. Um, and her tenderness, when we focused it on this, was a, was a little bit uh, lower. And it was interesting because, you know, the appendicolith and then fluid surrounding with, within the, uh, the appendix and, uh, and having a relatively crisp, crisp wall. So, yeah, sometimes you actually see that smoking gun, that appendicolith. There's another appendix, okay? And they're sort of transferring from a transverse view to switch over to a longitudinal view a little bit, and then the clip sort of carries over, okay? So again, you see the layers of the gut. You see that there's no peristalsis. It's greater than six millimeters. It wasn't compressing. What's this structure down here? Psoas, right? You see that muscular signature, okay? Now, here again, it's thick enough, it's non-compressible, and then there might be a little hyperemia around it. Every now and then you'll see a study in the radiology literature looking at uh, hypervascularity around an appendicitis or around a cholecystitis. Um, I don't really know too many radiologists that use it on a regular basis, but uh, sometimes you can see that. You should really be seeing the other characteristics anyway. And there again, a longitudinal view showing you that gut signature, blind ending tube coming around. So sometimes you don't see the appendix, but in the right lower quadrant, in the area that you saw the psoas and the iliacs, you see some loops of bowel and then a little smidge of free fluid, right? So just like a radiologist, you could conjecture, given the right clinical context, that I might be looking at a ruptured appendicitis, okay? So the fact that you don't see the appendix obviously doesn't rule out appendicitis. And in fact, if your, if your antenna were already up because of the clinical picture and you're seeing a little free fluid in the right lower quadrant, and sometimes within the bowel loops, right? Because like, it's not in the fast exam location, but within the bowel loops, that could be concerning that there could be a little pocket, a little abscess, um, and a ruptured appendicitis. And again, another example of an appendicolith there. All right. Um, and then was this the one? No. Th and then just one thing to, to keep in mind. I think it was one of the images that didn't come over well, so I'll just tell you the story. One of my colleagues was like, I saw an appendicitis, and then, you know, but he doesn't do that many of them, so he, he just had the patient go to radiology, which, by the way, that, that might be a perfectly valid workflow. Like, again, I don't feel like more of a hero because I, the surgeon took my word directly and whisked the patient down to the operating room. Heck, a lot of people, adults and kids, are getting treated with antibiotics, and that's it for appendicitis, right? So if the phone call to radiology is, I think I see appendicitis, can you guys have a look with ultrasound? That's a totally different conversation and a totally different triage of resources than just saying like, oh, I, don't, I got another kid with belly pain, then I don't have any labs back yet, but I think they might need an ultrasound and I'm making more work for you, right? So even if that's your workflow, that radiology is getting expedited because of your ultrasound, that's, that's great and maybe that's a first step or maybe that's just where you land at your institution, you're still moving the care forward. So my colleague says, yeah, I call radiology, the patient went over there and, um, and it was actually normal, it was weird. So we looked at the images and it was interesting and I was like, well, did it compress? He's like, ah, oh, it didn't compress it. Well, was there peristalsis? He's like, the appendix can peristalsis? So we're like, well, no, but the, forget it. And how, how big was it? He was like, I don't know. I put the probe where the pain was and I saw the appendix. So what happened was this guy just had that, you know, well, not one in a million shot, but maybe the one in 50 shot where he just put the probe down and saw a normal appendix. 
And we're, we get in our minds sometimes that if I'm seeing the appendix, it must be abnormal that he mistook a normal appendix, which he thought he shouldn't be able to see for appendicitis. So it's just sort of something to keep in mind to, you know, again, just because you see the appendix, don't get fired up. Make sure you go back to the, the, the definitions to define what appendicitis is. Appendicitis isn't just you seeing the appendix. All right, any questions on appendicitis? Yeah. Where do you mark the distance to get the six millimeters, the outer wall to the outer wall of the appendix? All right, so in a susception. So um, as we know, you can get uh, uh, telescoping of uh, one part of the intestine into the next. Um, it will not be on the quiz, what is the intussusception and what is the intussusception, whatever, because um, that's the part that gets in and the other part that, uh, that accepts the intussusceptions. Um, it's bad enough if you, it's good enough if you can spell into susception. Um, and, uh, but the most common site is ileocolic. They can sort of happen any place. And especially in kids, ileocolic. If, you hap if it happens in adults, especially when it's associated with other gut disease, it can kind of happen anywhere because you can get some pathologic lead points that allow this to happen. So x-ray, very nonspecific, right? There's a nonspecific bowel gas pattern or paucity of gas or whatever, but this is a patient that has an into susception. Um, ultrasound, again, in, in the hands of radiologists, because they, they've moved towards using ultrasound as their primary modality for this, 98% sensitive, 98% specific, and, uh, and point of care folks are pretty good at looking at it also. The thing you're going to look for, which is the intussusception itself, is sometimes referred to as a donut sign or a pseudo kidney sign. And that's basically this circle within a circle. Right? So you're looking around, you see gut and bowel and stuff. And remember, you're not looking everywhere, right? There's like muscle and bowel da and, and vessels down there, skin and soft tissue and peritoneum there. So you're looking at the gut itself. And then, you know, this one sort of sticks out, doesn't it? It's got a thicker wall and d layers of dark and bright, okay? You've got wall edema and you've got layers of mucosa. So you're going to have shades of gray circumferentially uh, around each other. So there's another example of what you're looking for. And again, I typically go over the site of pain with intussusception since the pain is like visceral and a little somatic. It can be a little uh, irregular and also the kids are, tend to be younger. So you tend to have to do that, um, that uh, John Deere lawnmower up and down the abdomen a little bit more to find intussusception. But again, it's a little kid so it doesn't take that long, right? Here's another example, right? And that may be one that looks a little more like a pseudo kidney in there. There's the, there's the whole piece there. And then the little piece of it there could be like cortex and medulla and fool you. And you also get a loss of uh, sense of scope because this is zoomed in a little bit too much. So you start focusing in on the tiny piece instead of the big piece where it's gut and then other gut inside, okay? Look at it in a longitudinal view, and I won't, you know, give you a, a, a headache to try to trace out the layers here, but basically the gut's kind of going back and forth here and back and forth there where it has slipped into itself in a longitudinal view. And again, here's another example. We're just going where the pain is, right? Slide in where the pain is, typically starting in the right side, following up the, um, the, uh, the ascending colon, right? Yeah, um, and then, uh, and then try to transversing along the transverse column. So again, pseudo kidney uh, or, or donut. That one really looks sort of kidney-ish, right? It almost, and, and in other angles, it almost looks a little bit like duodenum that you can see sideways coming in towards the, um, towards the uh, liver as well. So again, you can see layers and you can see some swirl on the inside sometimes. So, and then just what I think is cool is then, so the patient then goes to radiology, they'll get an air enema, and then, you know, you start off with the intussusception up in here, right? So there's, a, there's a, I want to say opacification, but there's, there's, you can visualize through the gut here, and then it's blocked up there, and as they slowly instill air, boop, 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 it just clears up, patient's right as rain, and typically can go home, all right? So again, intussusception and appendicitis, for, from my perspective, uh, I start by just probing where the pain is. Okay, and then using graded compression, uh, first very little pressure, and if I'm not seeing anything, gradually more and more and more until I see structures emerge, and then back and forth between too much pressure and too little pressure, and that's going to be the trick to finding the appendix. 
Try to find the landmarks for the appendix. It's going to be the psoas muscle, the iliac vessels, and the peritoneum. And that's going to take away 80% of your screen real estate that you don't have to worry about. And then you can focus your vision and your, and your brain power on the remaining area. And then just watch for peristalsis. It's going to be important for both of these because the, a kidney and a donut, in case you find those in the abdomen, are not going to peristalse. The intussusception might. And, the, uh, and if you think there's appendicitis and it's peristalsing, it's probably not. And you might be looking at a little compressed loop of bowel. All right, so... Uh, any further questions for me forever, you know, like a year from now, you're scanning, you're running into trouble, you can contact through me through our website. We've also got some tutorials and vids on there and stuff. And um, I'm on Twitter at Brett P. Nelson. So there you have it. Appendicitis and intussus, oh, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Now, I know we've gone over appendicitis before, but really, could you ever get enough? These are two quick diagnoses that can protect your pediatric patients from excessive radiation and get you to the diagnosis quicker. So next time you see that pediatric belly pain, chill out with those non-diagnostic x-rays and please, please pick up a probe before ordering a CT scan. If you want to see awesome lectures like this one and more live next April, head on over to castlefest2017.com. So we believe in FOMED. We want to get this education out there for free as much as we possibly can. And that's why we give this away, so you can take better care of your patients. But there's just something about being there in person. Being with the most ultrasound passionate people in the world. Amazing things happen when you get all of those people together in a castle and combine amazing education with four of the most fun days you'll ever have. Here are a few pictures from this lecture day last year just to give you some context. Attempt to adjust your dial. I'm transmitting live with the hardcore style. Fresh new kicks in the all star glow. I'm up in the mix. This Paul Large Pro. Straight out the gate with the fabulous track. And my devastating rhymes get the platinum plaque. For the underground world, every street and borough. Even out of state, large here to reach new levels. No doubt came from out the dungeons of rap. Making use of the brain that was under the cap. Used to dig them games that was from my rack. Was out on vacation, but now I'm back. With the stick drive. And dive, gotta be live. Breathe life in the speaker and try to revive. This game cast is laying under the floor. I'ma always rain cause I'm from New York and I'm quick, quick, radioactive. 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 I don't sleep, wink or nod, matter of fact I'll be up going hard while you flat on your back Concrete street trooper with a made up mind And it really don't matter, the date or time I'm authentic, believe me I walk within it Every day style fresh, kid, yours is did it Get a paint job, ain't y'all sick to frontin' Keep it up, in a minute I'ma hit the button On this planet, youngsters, you could can it Worldwide from the Pacific to the Atlantic Got it locked in soon with the hem and cuff Everybody that go to the gym ain't If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. <laughs>